Well, like many of you, I've sat in meetings where all the metaphors are about warlike endeavors. And as much as I actually love military history, I can see how that may, that no longer applies. We also had a lot of great breakouts. <clears throat> Digital and social veterans told us about their worst failures and how they overcame them and even flourished from their mistakes. I, um, I heard about this, I wasn't in the room, but uh, one of our panelists who works at Coca-Cola told his company executives once about what he was doing with social and the executive said, well, no one's ever gonna use their phones for pictures. Um, so clearly that was not the case. Uh, we also had a panel of analytic experts taking your questions about data. And this is a really important theme to all of us, I know. You're going to see a lot more content coming from us at Social Media Today on data, social data, operational, operationalization of data. And we have a site, Smart Data Collective, which was recently named one of the top sites, one of the top 10 sites for data scientists. And we're going to be bringing that community and all that great content into the SMT site. So if you're a follower, if you're getting our newsletters, if you're following us on Twitter or Facebook or in our LinkedIn group, you're gonna to start to see some really intelligent discussion about data. I hope it, it doesn't go over your head like it goes over mine, but I, I think you'll find a lot of grounds for engaging with some of the smartest people in the data science world. Um, speaking of new content initiatives, it's my particular pleasure to announce that we're going to be hosting exclusively Dan Gingas' uh, podcast on customer service. It's called Focus on Customer Service. Dan, are you, are you here? Right here in the front audience, guys. <clears throat> Dan, can you stand up? What, what, what is, who are some of the first people you're interviewing? exclusive columns that we'll be bringing out on top of all the great original content hacking that Mary Ellen and her team of eight round the clock people. We have, we have a content hacker in Wales, we have a content hacker in Australia, and it's really thrilling to me. I, I, can't, I can't emphasize this enough how great this content has become. So if you haven't checked this out on the home page, if you haven't followed us lately, all you're doing is waiting for me to push you something. Go back and take a look at some of, uh, particularly the new columns and the original content that the hackers are putting together. Because the stuff is amazing. Speaking of the new way to work, uh, as some of you may know, we recently partnered with IBM uh, to help them with their roadshow on this topic. I, you probably don't know this, but we work with IBM and South by Southwest on this topic, and new way to work is actually comes from the lips of Jenny Rometty. This is an important initiative for IBM. Um, it takes IBM from its enterprise focus into a whole new direction where they're speaking much more directly to new business people and thought leaders, and we're really flattered that they turn to us to help develop this and to bring a whole new audience to their roadshow, which will start June 23rd in Chicago. So everyone in this room who's anywhere near Chicago, please go to the website. It's um, 
you can you can look just hashtag you way to work or come to social media today and find the details on this. And you're also uh, invited, encouraged to share this with your colleagues who are in Chicago. Um, I think this is a thrilling initiative, and the content that Social Media Today and others are bringing together is, is phenomenal. I just participated in a crowd chat that IBM pulled together with one of their leading data experts and an expert on uh, the new way to work in finance. And it was, it was incredible, it was mind-blowing stuff. And I think we all are, in this room, aware that we're on the brink of something truly extraordinary. And I think, you know, hats off, kudos to IBM for taking a leadership role in these discussions, really around the world. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Social Media Today's advisor, my personal friend, and the head of Leader Networks, Vanessa DeMarlo. I'm just going to tell the, the, the fashion intervention story before you come up. So, so yesterday, just yesterday, yeah, yesterday morning, no, it was, uh, it was Monday before we all got started, um, I noticed uh, that the outfits that I'd ordered from Rent the Runway hadn't appeared, and I was in a total panic. So I, I, I found Vanessa, and I said, I've got to go to a store and get some clothes. And she dropped everything she was doing to go up, find something for me, take it off the rack, you know, get me through the, the checkout. And she was just amazing. And I, you know, as much as I depend on this woman for any good idea I've ever had, I, I found a whole new reason to be grateful to you for your fashion intervention. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Vanessa DeMarlo. Good morning, everyone. And it's my great pleasure to have an opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning. I have to say, as an advisor to social media today, I'm so thrilled when the team decided to invite Mark as today's speaker, um, as today's keynote with Shaco. That's because shakers and physical makers are fueled by the same fire. We're here to embed to design, to tinker, and even to create. Whether we're using social tools to push boundaries um, of the next generation marketing like we all do every day, or as a maker, we're physically welding a laser cutter. We're driven to experiment, to change things, and to make them better. And no one understands this innate drive better than Mark. I got to spend a lot of time with him last night at dinner, and you know, the stories and the community and the the brilliance that they're creating at his firm is just remarkable. Um, he's the CEO of TechShop, a company that democratized access to all the tools, information, resources, and most importantly, the community people need to design and innovate. He's a former Green Beret. Mark has held executive positions um, focused um, on innovation, disruptive technology, and entrepreneurship at large and small firms that include Avery Denison, Kinko's, and HealthNet. He holds an MBA from the Drucker Center at the Claremont Graduate University, and has a BA in economics for the University of California at Irvine. So ladies and gentlemen, let's make some noise for a pioneer of the maker movement, Mark Hatch. Thank you very much, Vanessa, and uh, good morning, social media today. So uh, I'm going to talk some about the maker movement, um, its impact, uh, how it's changing society. There are a couple of ways that it's doing it with cities, companies, and education. I'm going to finish with a challenge um, because we're going to I'd like to encourage people to join uh, the movement, and then at the very end, I'm going to do a quick little segue on how this is relevant to uh, to marketing uh, and social in particular. Um, as a former Green Beret, I love radical things. I've actually trained in how to run a revolution. That's part of what Green Berets do. Um, and we also love to blow things up. We love to blow convention up. We love to blow buildings up. It's a funny thing. So I love the word boom. And there are going to be a whole bunch of really interesting stories that I'm going to tell where you're going to want to express yourself 
Um, and so I'm going to help you with that, and it helps us in the morning to stay uh, energized. So I need you to say boom when you count to three, and then throughout the presentation, I will ask you to, uh, to say boom a few more times. So let's practice real quick. One, two, three. Boom. I'm do a little better now. One, two, three. Boom. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. All right, so I have written a book uh, on the topic. It's called The Maker Movement Manifesto. My publisher insists that I mention it whenever I talk. Thank you very much. So the Maker Movement is starting to get uh, quite a bit of press. Uh, this is uh, the President of the United States visited our location in Pittsburgh uh, about actually this week, uh, last year, and a precursor to the White House Maker Fair. This is the first time we had uh, the President and a national spotlight on uh, the Maker Movement itself. And as it happens, this Friday is the second annual um, National Maker Fair. And it's encouraging to see this kind of activity within, uh, within the space. Let me describe Tech Shop though first. I'm gonna kind of set the stage on um, why this is working, um, why it is so disruptive. So Tech Shop itself is a membership-based, do-it-yourself fabrication studio. Membership-based means for $150 a month, you get access to the complete platform. Open access means anybody that's 16 years old or older can come in and use the space. In fact, with adult supervision, we push it all the way down to eight years old. We have summer camps where kids can come in and use these tools. DIY means you do it yourself. We don't do it for you. We're not a uh, prototyping uh, you know, uh, business. You get to do it yourself. Each location is about 20,000 square feet. It's every tool you need to make just about anything on the planet. We teach hundreds of classes every month. We have all kinds of fun corporate events. Lasers and beer, welding and wine, water jet and whiskey, Sambuco and sandblasting. One, two, three. <laughs> Absolutely, power tools and alcohol, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so lots of machine tools. Uh, so quick, you know, quick view, these are the standard industrial tools that uh, began in the industrial, you know, helped to kick off the industrial revolution. Computer numerically controlled machines, 3D printers, uh, laser cutters, I'm going to talk some about them. This is a remarkable tool. We can teach you how to use it in about two or three hours, and you can make all kinds of great stuff uh, out of it. Complete sheet metal shop, welding studio, day night for welding. Learning how to weld with your significant other is a lot of fun. Uh, the water jet, we call this our sexy beast. This thing will cut through five inches thick of anything on the planet. Computer numerically controlled. You can download a design off the internet, cut it out in granite, and we can teach you how to use this tool in two hours. You go from not being able to design something to be able to de literally design your kitchen granite countertop in a couple hours one evening this week. Complete woodworking studio, including computer numerically controlled routers, complete plastic slab, software electronics. This is one of the most important pieces of the story. The software is getting easier and easier and easier to use. Ten years ago, if you wanted to to get on a mill and manufacture something and you wanted to use a computer numeric controlled mill to do it, it would take you six months to a year to become moderately facile at using the tool. Now we are teaching people how to use this tool in three class sessions. I talked to a recent friend of mine who had spent you know, his career at RISD and he described a project that he recently did where the knowledge that he needed to do the project took about three hours a decade ago, it would have taken them six months. We are living in a radically different space, and software is a big enabler. We have uh, textiles, computer numeric controlled quilting machines, large projects. I mentioned group events, lasers of beer, welding and wine, and so forth. But don't get distracted by the tools. That's not the actual thing that we're doing. What we're doing is we're aggregating the most creative community of makers in every city that we open in. We do it at scale, so the objective is to get over 500 members. We're averaging about 800 members per uh, location. We have eight locations currently across the U.S. Once you get over 500, what happens is the community catalyzes. And it come, it, you start coming to the location not because you need to get your work done. You start coming because you want to to get your work done. And when that, when that happens, you're now two degrees of freedom from success. So if you run into a problem and you don't know what the solution is, and it can vary everything from how do I launch a social media campaign, how do I file a, a provisional patent, how do I tighten the collar on a, um, uh, on a mill. You go to our dream consultant, you ask, tell me you've got a question, and if they can't answer it, 
right now there is somebody on site who has the domain expertise to answer that question. And that is remarkable. In San Francisco on a Thursday, Friday afternoon and evening, we will have professors from major universities, electronics professors, physics and so forth, we'll have students from the same places. We'll have engineers from Cisco, from Hewlett Packard, we'll have merchandisers uh, from Macy's, we'll have designers from Fraud Design, from IDEA, from Method. We'll have startup engineers from Twitter, from Facebook, from Google. We'll have some artists that do Burning Man projects, which I absolutely love. These crazy massive steel structures that shoot big, huge balls of fire. One, two, three, boom, yeah. Um, and when you aggregate all of them, you now have the ability to get just about anything done in a very short period of time. We've done 24 seven because we believe that you can create at any point in time. So again, don't get distracted by the tools. That is not the business we're in. We're actually in the transformative experience business where we move people from where they are to where they want to be or where they need to be uh, in the future. And we're actually teaching, we're, on Friday we're announcing we're teaching other people how to uh, launch these spaces. So I often get asked, um, you know, what's so special about the, the maker movement. I mean, I've been to the, the Maker Fair and I've seen all these cute projects um, and I've seen the kids running around that they saw around the little blinky lights. And, um, you know, as far as I can tell, it just looks like a you know, glorified 21st century version of a country fair. And I tell people, yes, that's absolutely true. That is a piece of what's happening in the movement. But you're not capturing what's happening in advanced manufacturing. You're not capturing what's happening um, on the software, on, on the hardware side of the software electronics. Um, and when you give people access to the tools of the Industrial Revolution, literally for the first time in human history, you've done something completely new and completely different. As a result, we've had all kinds of really fascinating projects come out. Like, this is the world's fastest electric motorcycle. It did 210 miles an hour, actually 218 miles an hour in the Bonneville Salt Flats, one winning the Guinness Book of World Records for electric motorcycles. They built the entire thing in our Menlo location from the ground up. Anything they couldn't buy off the shelf, they built themselves. The carbon fiber fairing, the uh, aluminum frame, uh, the motor. You can't buy a super bike electric motor. You have to build it yourself. The electric harness, there's no such thing. You can't go down to the store and buy a super electric bike uh, uh, electric harness. You have to build the entire thing from the ground up. This thing is so fast at one pipe's peak this last year. Not only did it beat all of the other electric motorcycles, it destroyed the entire field. When was the last time you saw a professional race when the first place finisher finished 20 seconds ahead of the second place finisher? It's never happened in my life. The Ducati Superbike came across 20 seconds later. Ken had a massage and a beer by the time he started. <laughs> One, two, three, boom. In September, you'll be able to buy this off of his showroom floor, and it will do 218 miles an hour. I don't recommend it. This thing is wickedly fast. It's much faster than a uh, naturally aspirated bike off the shelf. And Andy's working on a jetpack. Thank goodness somebody's working on jetpack. I was promised a jetpack. Andy says he was promised a jetpack. He can actually tell you the cover story, you know, Popular Mechanics, 1974. There was a jetpack. I thought I'd have one by the time I graduated from high school. General Motors isn't working on it. Boeing's not working on it. Andy is. I was, what's funny about this one is, um, you know, I, we have a lot of people that come through our space, and, and we kind of know they're crazy. Um, you know, but it's hard to, to, to filter, is, are they crazy in a good way or a bad way? And uh, it turns out Andy's crazy in a good way. But we had a bunch of NASA folks come through, and um, they kind of laughed when I got to the slides. Like, yeah, yeah, Andy's working on jetpack. We actually have jetpacks. We don't have jetpacks. Uh, so, yeah, but Andy's doing some interesting stuff. Like, yeah, whatever. World Space Agency, we have jetpacks. So interestingly enough, when I come around the corner where I'm giving them the tour, and uh, Andy's got an office on site in our San Jose location, and sure enough, there is a NASA jetpack in his space. Because if you're serious about what you're doing, you have prior art, and you buy the prior art, and you decompose it to find out what, it, what the current state of the art is. 
So the NASA guys were completely geeking out because they actually didn't get to play with space packs very much. So that they, you know, those going to outer space. So they open the door and Andy comes around the corner um, and he's pretty excited because he loves the NASA guys. And uh, they geek out for a little while. And then Andy uh, pulls out of his pocket a little nozzle that he had just 3D printed. He says, you won't believe what I was just able to achieve. This cost me about a dollar. And using some math around Venturi and Bernoulli effects, I've been able to increase the airflow from one end of this nozzle to the other end of the nozzle by 20-fold. You guys are doing that, right? Andy now works as a consultant to NASA. <laughs> and they've got CubeSats he's working on them, and he's actually, they're doing chip sets now, where they actually load up a cartridge of uh, like 150 satellites in a little small package and it spits them out, and he's working on that one. It's really remarkable kind of guy. Crazy in a good way. Uh, we've had a bunch of CubeSats launch uh, as well um, out of the space station. This is Tina. I love Tina. Um, she came in and took the laser cutter class on Wednesday. And on Thursday, she didn't know what she was making, had you know, scheduled some time on Friday to come in. And she got a call from um, uh, her sister and said, hey, you gotta come in to your nephew's birthday party on Saturday. And so Tina said, hey, give me the names of all the kids and I will use my laser cutter time tomorrow to cut their names out in pieces of bamboo and stick them on uh, cupcakes. And so that's what she did. Um, so she comes in on Saturday morning and hangs out with the kids. They do their little thing. And at the end, the parents come in and, you know, Bobby's got a cupcake topper and Jane's got a cupcake topper, but their siblings back home don't. So she walked out of that birthday party with $400 in orders. She didn't know she was in business when she arrived. <laughs> One, two, three, boom. Ooh. She's done so well. Um, she's been featured in Martha Stewart Living. She's got an Etsy, a very successful Etsy uh, platform. She's written a book and a DVD on how to launch uh, an Etsy uh, store. She disappeared for a little while, and when she came back, I asked her, Tina, where have you been? She said, Mark, my husband, when my husband and I got married, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. I'm, I'm a labor organizer by training. And so we launched this little business, and um, so we finally did our honeymoon. I took my husband on a six-month world tour. One class, accidental entrepreneur, she's doing hundreds of thousands, high-gross marketing business out of a little tech shop in Northern California. One, two, three, boom, go Tina. Karen came in the first time I met him. Uh, he came in and he introduced himself. He says, Mark, I'm a copy, I'm an ad copywriter for a newspaper. Which is a bad time to be an ad copywriter for a newspaper. Uh, I'm 62 years old, they just uh, laid me off. I'm never going to work as an ad copywriter in a newspaper again. I'm going to remake myself as a jeweler. That's an obvious transition, right? <laughs> copywriting to jewelry. Uh, sure enough, within six months, Perrin started having his uh, postmodern uh, jewelry show up in the university, or, I'm sorry, the museum stores in San Francisco. He's now distributed across the United States in all kinds of high-end museums um, and um, all, all things as he does animals, uh, zoos. He's doing, he's doing quite well. David came in, um, I ran into him in our San Francisco location. And he came up and said, Mark, um, I'm writing a column, it's called Zero the Maker. Um, I just, just got it, and I signed up for my very first class. So, well, David, what's your story? He says, well, I've been, I've been sailing for the last couple of years, and I've been working as the, uh, the media guy for this sailing school. Um, and I got excited about the maker movement, and I want to become a maker pro. I don't know how to make anything. I've never made anything in my life. Well, he says, that's not true. I do really good at email. Does that count? <laughs> So, well, of course it counts, David, but you're working with your hands is going to be completely different. Nine months later, he launched an underwater robot company. It's an open access, remotely operated vehicle. He's got over a thousand of these that have been sold. He has he's helped driving the citizen science movement uh, for underwater exploration. He's had scientists at both poles sneak these things in. They, they like doing little side projects. And these things are cheap enough that uh, anybody can do it. 
He went from not knowing how to do anything to owning a robot company in nine months. One, two, three, boom. Britt uh, Warren came in, she quit her job at Google, launched a uh, lifestyle company uh, called Britt Co. If you're not aware of it, I can take, check it out, it's phenomenal. Um, she helps, she's kind of like a Martha Stewart. She, she has other women uh, help design little craft packages that you can then turn into some really cool things. She just raised $20 million in a series B. Mark came in, this is one of our more fantastic stories. Um, so, we ran a special, it was like a sampling idea. So it was 50 bucks, you get a whole month membership in a class if you've never been a member before. Um, Mark was homeless in a shelter in San Francisco when two guys who had done a, one of our free tours came in, described what they had just seen, and then threw our brochure away in the trash can. So he fishes it out of the trash can, reads it, says, hmm, this is something I could do. And by the way, I've got a lot of time on my hands because uh, I'm, I'm homeless. Um, so he came in the next day, spent his last $50 on that class and uh, a one month membership. Learned how to use the laser cutter. Again, it's great, it's a phenomenal tool. The next day he comes in, doesn't have a budget to be able to buy materials, so he fishes stuff out of our supply bin, our trash bin cuts things out and goes back out on the street and sells it. And then comes back in, cuts more stuff out, goes back out on the street and sells it. Step, repeat, step, repeat, step, repeat. He then gets so good at the laser cutter that other members start hiring him to run their laser jobs at 25 to 50 bucks an hour. Unbeknownst to us, you know, he's homeless, we hire him as a laser instructor. He then convinces the community a little Kickstarter campaign and some friends to help buy him a laser cutter. Again, nobody knows he's homeless. He goes into a laser cutter service business. He now has an office on site. He's got a couple of employees. He has completely rebooted his life on a $50 laser cutter class. One, two, three, four. Well, what's really cool about Mark is he then set up a 501c3 where he's getting money from foundations in the Bay Area, and he's going into the homeless shelters and looking for guys and gals like him, pulling them out of the shelter, putting them up in a hotel or, or a, a long-term place to stay, getting them food and getting them a three-month membership in either our space or an American Steel across the, the Bay, and helping them launch businesses. Because a lot of them are, are you know, they're vendors, they've got a felony, um, you know, rap sheet, they're not going to be able to get, the, their, get a job. And so what he's doing is he's helping them create their own job. One, two, three, boom. We are operating a completely different space than we've ever been before. This is a 3D printing company that's launched a 3D printer. This is um, a beautiful uh, lamp. So I, I saw Max out on, the, uh, out on the tables, and I asked him what he was doing. He's like, hey, you know, I'm a, a designer for, and I won't name the company, it's a big retail company. Um, I do fixtures design. Now, that's kind of sad. If you go to four years of design school and then you end up at a retailer doing fixtures design, what that means is your job is to create shelving that nobody notices because you're supposed to be showing off the product. So his job is to be invisible. Most designers, when they become designers, don't really want to be invisible. That's not what they aspire to. And so he was having motivational issues around us. You know, he'd been doing it for about three years. He says, Mark, I want to own my own lamp company. I came in, I learned how to use the laser cutter. I've taken the Arduino classes, which does the, all the electronic stuff. Um, and I'm going to do a Kickstarter campaign. He's like, great, how much money are you going to raise on Kickstarter? He says, $60,000. Ooh, Max. That's really hard. Um, half of the hardware Kickstarter campaigns over 25 million bucks don't get funded. Are you sure you need 60 grand? He goes, yeah, I need 60 grand. But besides, Mark, the, you know, the lamp is really nice. Is that gorgeous or what? Yeah, Max. So he raises $480,000 on Kickstarter, and all of a sudden he has an inventory and work in process problem that he had not imagined he was going to have. Uh, he was the uh, season um, finale on Shark Tank this last year. All five sharks went nuts over his product. 
Um, he had doubled the valuation of his company during the, the presentation. They gave him a six million dollar uh, valuation um, and, and a bunch of money to, to, to launch. Um, this didn't exist ten years ago. Kickstarter did not exist ten years. Indiegogo did not exist ten years ago. It's estimated that in 2016, more money will flow through the crowdfunding sites than the entire venture capital industry, which is good news, by the way, because only 12% of the publicly held companies come out of venture capital. We democratize access to the capital markets through things like Indiegogo and, um, and Kickstarter. We've democratized access to the channels through things like eBay and Etsy and now tech shop and makerspace to democratize access to the manufacturing back end so that you can launch companies now for a couple of thousand dollars. The reason I got involved is I happened to, to uh, run into the founder at an event and he drug me over to the location. I talked to three entrepreneurial groups back to back and each one of them told me that they had saved 98% of their startup costs by launching out of tech shop. 98%. Basically, two orders of magnitude cheaper in the new world than in the old world, in something that is fundamentally driving economies around the globe. It's, it's a radical new space that we're operating in. This is another one. I love this one uh, because I, um, I wasn't a real, I wasn't a believer. Um, and this is one of the nice things about uh, the space and being able to launch a company for a couple of thousand dollars. You don't have to convince gray-haired MBA idiots that your market is actually worth going after, right? You don't have to talk to venture capitalists, you don't have to talk to angel groups, you don't have to talk to somebody like me and convince them to write you checks. If you can get orders on a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo campaign, you can launch. So I ran into Anton, who's actually pretty, um, pretty amazing, I'm up upstairs, and we have these big work benches, they're about uh, four foot by eight feet. They stand about 40 inches high, because so we want people to be able to stand up and work on them. Anton is on top of this thing. He's a big guy. He's about my size. And he's wrestling a 12-foot long piece of plastic. And he's losing. And I'm afraid he's going to fall off at any minute. He's got his knees up on it. He's you know, crushing it and moving it around. And so I go over to him and introduce myself and say, you know, what in the world are you doing? He says, oh, I'm building a collapsible kayak. Now, my instantaneous thought was, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard of in my life. That's what I want to do, is be out in the middle of San Francisco Bay in a collapsible kayak. Its main feature is that it collapses. That is a dumb idea. So Anton, where did you come up with this idea? It wasn't any better. And it's like, okay, what's your plan? I'm going to do a Kickstarter campaign. It's like, good luck with that. How much are you going to try to raise? $50,000. It's like, you're doomed. You know, it's just, I didn't tell him that. But it's like, you're doomed. First, it's a bad idea. Secondly, you're asking for way too much money. I hope you have a day job. He raises $450,000. He sells a thousand of these. He was also on Shark Tank and um, got funded on, um, on it. And, and in the Bay Area, when uh, the Giants did so well this last year, like half of the kayaks in the water were these collapsible kayaks. Like, who knew? Thankfully, he changed the name to or Oro Kayak, like Origami Kayak. Um, it, it's, I think it's better than collapsible kayak. <laughs> Some marketing guy got his, uh, got his hands around his neck at one point. Patrick came in and asked, what classes do I need to take to learn how to use the tools to manufacture an iPad case out of bamboo and book binding? What classes do I need to take? So there were three classes. 90 days later, he had sold a million dollars in product. I mean, what did you do during the summer of 2012? <laughs> Patrick picked up the skills that he needed and launched a company. He did $4 million in the first year, $10 million in the second, $35 million on the third. We believe he's on track to do between $60 and $100 million in iPad cases. An angel group would never fund this. Can you imagine this before the iPad came out? I've got this great idea. You know, he's all 28 years old. It's not a social thing. It's not a mobile app. It's not a gaming app. This is a physical piece of hardware. What do you know about bookbinding? What do you know about accessories for major electronics? Nothing. Nothing. What do you know about manufacturing? Nothing. Have you ever scaled a business before? No. 
Have you ever started a successful business before? No. Well, what have you been doing for the last year? I've attempted to start 12 companies, they've all failed. Great, Patrick, good luck with that. A million dollars in sales in the first 90 days after learning how to use tools, so it's a, it's a great story. And his lead user is no one less than the President of the United States. President Barack Obama carries the iPad case that Patrick learned how to use the tools to manufacture and launch the company in 90 days. One, two, three, boom. But we had an early hypothesis, and I want to really, I'm going to really drive it home before I invite you to join, uh, join us. Um, our early hypothesis was that if you gave the tools of the Industrial Revolution to the creative class of the United States and around the world, they could change the world. And actually, they already have. And this is one of the most exciting things about this movement, is it is unleashing an incredible amount of embedded talent in all of these major cities. So you've probably heard of Square. So James McKelvey, the co-founder of Square, came in and learned how to use the mill, learned how to use the injection molding machine, learn the basic electronics you needed to build the original prototype for Square. The back part of the story is that James and Jack Dorsey, of Twitter fame, of course, went to uh, uh, the Silicon Valley and pitched their idea to the top, ostensibly the top 10 VCs, the smartest investors on the planet. So I like to describe it, the smartest investors on the planet. Jack Dorsey and James come in, they pitch them the idea, and they ask James, um, or they ask, you know, they know Dorsey, it's like, hey, yeah, you do software, James, what do you do? I'm a glass blower from St. Louis. <laughs> oh, okay. You don't work for Chase Manhattan or Visa or Nashville? No, I'm a glass blower of St. Louis. Okay. No, we're not interested. They turned them down. Smartest investors on the planet turned Square down. Thankfully, James was smart enough to say, okay, what I really need is a prototype. He came into tech shop, learned the skills he needed to build a prototype, and then he and Jack went back out to the VCs, and instead of doing a PowerPoint, they walked in and said, I won't give the name, give me your black American Express card. They took $50 off each of the top 10, didn't give the money back. <laughs> I love it. It's the first team I've ever heard of charging VCs for presentations. <laughs> They raised $10 million, of course, now the story is, is history. These guys were personally responsible for helping to create 35,000 jobs in October of 2012. They literally increased the, the velocity of the money supply in the United States by enabling people who had never been able to take credit cards to start taking them. So all the taco trucks and taxi drivers and bakeries and cleaners were now able to take credit for the first time because Jack and James felt that they should be able to do it. It's bizarre, isn't it? Visa didn't know those people needed it or, would, or should have it. Chase didn't do it. Goldman didn't make it happen. It was a glass blower in St. Louis who figured out that this needed to happen. And we now live in an era where a smart glass blower in St. Louis can actually change the world. And he changed the United States in a very significant Phil Hughes um, built a liquid-cooled server cabinet, uh, spent $20,000, competed against IBM and Emerson in a head-to-head -head competition, destroyed them in the competition, and Emerson immediately licensed the technology. I won't go into the details here, but spending on cooling data centers globally is $250 billion a year. Phil is responsible for resetting that bar and helping the industry save 10% annually. I can do that now, 250 billion, 10%. $25 billion reduction in energy costs because Phil figured out stuff that IBM and Siemens and Emerson could. One, two, three, boom. boom. This is a nitrogen detection device. It figures out how much fertilizer is in the ground before the farmers go out and, uh, and fertilize. It was named one of the top five agricultural startups of the year. They went through four full production pre-production prototypes in a period of 12 weeks, not 12 months, 12 weeks, because they had access to the tools on site. This is a, uh, this one in a fast company, hardware social startup of the year, it's a camp stove that also charges electronics. 
not a big deal in the U.S., but in the second and third world, where you have rolling brownouts and you don't know when you may have electricity or not, this actually could be uh, a lifesaver, which is why um, they got the award. This is the world's cheapest drip irrigation system. It was also given one of the top five agricultural startups of the year. Let me pause there. In 2014, two of the top five ag startups came out of our Menlo Park location. When you give the creative class access to the tools of the Industrial Revolution for the first time, they change the world. We have people move to our cities. We have people move from less expensive cities to more expensive cities because it turns out it's cheaper to rent in downtown San Francisco and use our facility than it is to hire a prototyping shop to do it for you. And then this one is my favorite one. Jane came out of the, um, uh, the D school uh, in Stanford, and this uh, Jane and Nagadon, uh, her team. Um, so the, the idea here is uh, she had the World uh, Health Organization website, was clicking around, and she discovered that uh, there's a class of babies um, that have a problem, uh, specifically in the second and third world. If you're born two weeks too early, your hypothalamus isn't fully developed. And if your hypothalamus isn't fully developed, you need to get an into an incubator, and you basically have one hour. If you don't get to an incubator in one hour, die. 500,000 babies die every year from this condition. And she and her team said, is there any way of extending that hour? Like, could we create a little papoose? Could we put a polymer pouch in the back that could be heated out locally in the, in the villages? And so they spent um, the semester at Stanford coming up with the design. And when they graduated, they had had it up to an hour. So if they extended it from one hour to two hours. Then they came to our location in Menlo Park, and magic happened. I talked about community early on, right? If you look at Naganon, he's, I don't know, 26 years old in that photo. We had a research scientist, and I won't name from what company. Uh, we have research scientists at all of our locations. We attract those kinds of folks. This is what happened to have 30 years of polymer experience, polymer scaling experience, manufacturing experience. Naganon never scaled a polymer in his life. He never run a manufacturing. And in fact, he didn't actually understand all of the chemistry that he was working with. And so this chemist asked him, can I help you? Would you be willing to let me donate my time to help you extend that from one hour to something more? And so sure enough, they worked on it together, and they were able to extend it from one hour to four hours. So you go, wow, three hours, that's three times, three-fold increase. But when you put it in a geography, it's actually a geometric. So it's actually a nine-fold increase in the impact donated by members of the community. This blanket has already saved 150,000 babies. A decade ago, if they had come up with this idea and they graduated from Stanford, they would have left Stanford and gotten a job. This would not exist. They'll tell you flat out, if they had not had access to our makerspace, this would not exist. We're living in a completely new world. So I'm gonna give you a challenge. Oh, I gotta get to the partners. All right. So this is the city's partners. This is the city's partners. I'm gonna do this really quickly. So who's being involved? It's not just the uh, individuals. This is a, our partner list. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples, like the software. They've launched an entire division focused on the makerspace. That's Autodesk. Ford Motor Company built the tech shop. We built it. They, they funded the tech shop in, in Dearborn. Their objective, they had three things they were hoping to do, any one of which would fund the entire thing. 10% increase in high quality, patentable ideas coming into their office, a new product idea that worked its way on the car, and an increased engagement with the research and development community. Not only have we, we, we've hit all three, the research and development community is now fully engaged in a much more open, innovation way. A new product idea is working its way onto the car. It came out of marketing, not R&D, which is really cool. And they were targeting a 10% increase in high quality path alignment. So this is Clay Shirky's idea around cognitive surplus. Every community, every uh, major brand, every company has excess capabilities that they're not tapping into. The question is how do you unleash them? So their idea was we would give uh, tech shop memberships away to Ford employees that had a, a great idea or had filed a patent on it. And if they could get the 10% increase, it would fund the entire thing. 
100% increase. The, uh, the, the guy who came up with the program has won a national, international award on helping to entrepreneur at a major company like, uh, like Ford. Again, access to tools is, uh, is everything. Fujitsu is another partner of ours. We're working with them on, on democratizing access to actually the supply chain. General Electric and the Veterans Department helped fund our locations in Pittsburgh and, and DC. Genie's got this great thing, it's called Genie Garages. We're the back office for Genie Garages. So it's popped up in, I think, 10 cities uh, across the world. And it's a uh, STEM, STEAM education platform where you know, thousands of kids can come through in a, in a couple of days and learn all about um, advanced manufacturing and, and what it means. Uh, it's a very, very cool program. Uh, the city of Chandler, in conjunction with Arizona State University, funded our location in Chandler. So let me repeat what I just said. We have government agencies funding our locations, not us. We have educational institutions funding our locations, not us. We have cities. Why would they do that? Well, the answer is because cognitive surplus is a huge opportunity for, uh, um, uh, for major companies. Cities want to grow jobs. I'm going to talk about that the impact in just a second. And universities already have these tools, but they're not open to the, the entire community. So we can actually leverage existing resources in a way that's never been done before. So here's the impact, as best as we can tell, in the Bay Area. Just three locations, $12 billion in incremental shareholder value, 2,000 jobs, $200 million in annual salaries. The state of California is making more money on an annual basis on the income tax that we've spent on the entire platform, and they're doing it on an annual basis. Every major city needs a major maker space. It catalyzes innovation, it actually catalyzes the entire district. We're, re we're relaunching four acres in downtown San Francisco. It increases innovation and employee motivation and engagement, and it improves educational outcomes. Merely giving access and creating a community does all three of these things. It's a really powerful thing. So I want to invite you to join the maker movement, and here's the challenge. So um, my wife developed an allergy to flowers about five years ago. Um, kind of sucks here, guy. Um, Valentine's just got harder. Birthdays just got harder. You know, I can't just run to the grocery store at midnight on my, my way home from the bar and say, hey, happy birthday. Um, you know, now I actually have to think about it. Being an idiot, I started going to Tiffany's, um, which there aren't as many of them that are not open at midnight, and they're very expensive. Uh, so that's you know that's what I've been uh, doing for the last five years. And uh, then I bought a 3D printer, um, totally random. It's like you know I'm in the maker mood when I gotta have one at home, so I buy a 3D printer and I'm getting it set up, and I need a test print. So this is just like a regular printer. Once you get it set up, you know you have to do the calibration. You get a test print and it prints it out. It's same thing with laser, with 3D printers, you gotta create a test print. I don't have time to do the design, I don't have anything ready, and I say, okay, so I go online to think of verse, I'm rooting around, and bang, there's a plastic rose. Ah, perfect. I got a test print, I'll just print the rose, city will be thrilled. Um, so I fire it up, so I've literally downloaded in about two minutes, um, run it through the software in about three minutes, hit print, and then go off and I do my conference calls and work on my spreadsheets and do the PowerPoint so forth. Um, it finishes up, I clean it up a little bit, spend 20 minutes doing that while it's watching the news. Uh, and then my wife comes home about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. Um, so she comes in and I go, hey babe, I need you a rose. You. <laughs> I was stunned. Look at this. This is ugly. <laughs> it's green. You can see the lines. You can see the error. This is a test print. You know, my cognitive effort here was two minutes. It was way more meaningful than the Tiffany heart locket I had bought her for our anniversary. Why? Yeah, you know exactly why. Because I made it. No, no, I didn't. A printer made it. But I thought of her and I made the thing. So it turns out giving objects away that you've created and you've made and you've 
had some kind of an impact. And giving them to somebody else is a fundamentally different experience than buying something and giving it away. If you make something for your house, it becomes an heirloom. If you buy something for your house in 10 years, it becomes junk. If you make something and give it away, it becomes a personal memento. If you buy something and give it away in 10 years, it becomes junk. This is sitting on our headboard. It makes absolutely no sense from a physical perspective, but from an emotional perspective, it makes all the sense in the world. And so I challenge you to make something for somebody this year so you can begin to experience what it means to be in the maker movement. And I'm going to do the quick transition to social. So I'm working with some friends. They work at the Agency of Trillions, AOT, and uh, they've come up with this uh, mnemonic. They call it POEM, P-O-E-M. And they say that advertising falls into these four buckets, and there's a new bucket. P is for paid media, that's advertising, what you buy. O is for owned media, that's packaging, that's the stuff that you know, that's the uh, buses and the transportation and so forth. Earned media is what we're doing here, this is social uh, media. Main media, M, is what you co-produce with your customers and vendors. And when you co-produce something, you come up with a story that has a very, very deep impact. It will turbocharge your social media, your earned media, your own media, and your purchase media. So I think I've got time for just a couple of questions and be glad to answer. Thank you very much. particularly relevant for our crowd is that you're talking about uh, you know a, one of the big brands that you're working with that you right. put them on the screen and you were getting a little resistance to this idea of prototyping a new product right. and um, they were worried you know the, the prototype I think you, you said the proposal was around twenty thousand dollars tops right so they, they were saying well, what if this doesn't work and you said hey if it doesn't work, it's a data point. Right. Yeah, so I think this is also part of what's exciting about this time is that you're giving us all permission to fail and to learn from that. Right. And that's, that's just... Yeah, I don't, we don't call it failure anymore. We call it cheap marketing. Yeah, exactly. But when you're doing it for two or three grand, it's not, Even it's not, it's not failure. That, that's just a, a, another data point. Yeah, exactly. I bet we've got questions this morning, so um, raise your hand. In the front row, Mr. Yarmus, I believe. You believe correct. <laughs> Big brands are starting to get involved in, in the movement as, as they recognize the power of it. Are, are you concerned that they end up co-opting it, or is this something where we're going to change them more than they change us? Yeah, well, I'm certainly hopeful it's the latter. Um, we'll, see, you'll, you'll have to see how it evolves over time. Currently, um, there are a couple of brands who have done it poorly, and it doesn't come off well. It's like doing social media poorly. I mean, it comes off very poorly. If they do it in a very authentic way, people absolutely love it. And, um, and if they do it in an authentic way, they have no chance but to be transformed in the process. Uh, because they've done it in an authentic way, it will have an impact on the internal. So sometimes it's a surprising one. One of the things that I noted in your presentation was that at Ford, we were developing a product that was driven out of the market. We've been talking about this uh, here at Shake Up, about the role that marketers now play in product development and design. Yeah. How, how did that happen? And, and did that cause a lot of problem with the manufacturing and product development side of the house? Yeah, you know, we are streaming, so I have to be careful. But um, you can imagine uh, most R&D communities have spent a lot of money on training. They have PhDs, and they have millions of dollars of big boy tools and they come into our little maker space and they, they see these short run production prototypes and they go yeah 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 that's really interesting um, but when Ford engaged us um, the uh, uh, Bill Coughlin uh, the man who brought us in he pointed something out that was fascinating it's true against uh, across the, the entire spectrum it says Mark we have 10,000 mechanical engineers in 30 mile radius do you know how many of them are still 
the mechanical engineers? Half. The other half have gotten out of engineering. Because it, it turns out spending three years on the left turn signal attachment is kind of boring and the marketing people are having more fun, so they, they get out. Since so we have 5,000 left, do you know how many of them are actually in research and development? So I can't tell you, but just do the math. They're all in operations. They're driving a $100 billion company. So actually, when you look at four of their 10,000 mechanical engineers that have decades of automotive experience, and they're, they're now in marketing and finance and sales, the percentage that are actually working on the next generation product is minuscule. That is a huge opportunity. And he saw it. So you know what I'm going to do? It's like, I believe that people are going to be able to innovate essentially for free, like a couple thousand dollars. And we're not going to need to go through the stage data new product development process that we've done such a good job in elegantly uh, building. And sure enough, it worked. The guy in marketing was, in, was engaged, and I can't tell you exactly where it was, but he was engaged with customers. He came up with the idea. He says, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. I, I can design this. Called Bill's team up. says, I want a tech shop membership. And within months, they had filed a patent on his new product idea. And it's working its way onto the automobile. Note to self, it didn't go through the stage gate of new product development process. It never went in front of the committee to decide whether or not it was a good idea. He just built the prototype. You know, it's, it's one thing, it's really easy, you probably know this in space as well as I do, it's really easy to turn down a marketing person on some project idea when all it is is PowerPoint. But when you walk in with the product and it's working, it gets really hard to turn them down. That's the boom. Boom. <laughs> Other questions? In the back, and tell us who you are. Um, hey, Mark, I'm Andrew McKee from Webster Capital. Um, one of the things that occurred to me during your talk, which I thought was amazing, is that um, young people, uh, I think, need to understand how to take advantage of this opportunity. And I'm wondering how you imagine that high schools and middle schools can start embracing this, because as we all know, shop class is not as relevant anymore as something like the maker movement. So I'm just curious how you see um, you know, school districts embracing this, and is this an opportunity in the near term or in the long term? Yeah, so um, it, you, you pointed out it, it's unfortunate right at the time when the tools have become cheap, easy, ubiquitous, we no longer have them in schools. It's like the <laughs> absolute worst possible time to not have them. Um, the good news is that there are, is a lot of momentum White House is, is engaged, uh, uh, Make Media is doing all kinds of things. We're launching a, a Makerspace Academy. We're going to teach libraries, museums, and high schools how to open their own uh, Makerspaces. And what's cool here is we're going to be able to mix both the trade skills as well as the first robotics clubs and get them um, engaged in the same space. So I think it's actually, I believe it's quite hopeful and very exciting. Problem is, of course, it's not part of the Common Core, and it's going to take years for it to work its way into the into the schools. So we're going to see these in after-school programs and libraries and first robotics clubs first. We'll see foundations fund grants to take capture small spaces in the schools. But it's going to take a while for it to actually seep in, which is unfortunate. The good news is this is cheap enough that your kids can actually engage it, and middle-class kids are going to be able to engage it pretty easily and very quickly. Um, the sad thing is in the poor areas of disadvantage, they are not going to get access to it, and that's where we really do need states and governments, universities, and others to step up and play um, that we have the same interest. I love it. Uh, anyone else? Yes, please tell us who you are. Hi, Robin. I'm over here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm all in right back. Robin, look forward. Okay. <laughs> it's Jean Sachs. Oh, Jean. Yeah. Hi. There you are. Uh, oh, um, <laughs> my question is, how do you decide what location you're going to put a uh, tech shop in? So um, we follow our partners. Uh, we've attempted to evangelize going out and convince people they need to fund a tech shop that we would own and operate, which is kind of a weird business model, but that's, that's what we do. Uh, and so we, we failed at that miserably. We've gone out to cities and so forth. So now what we do um, is people call us and then we respond. So the city of St. Louis called us, the city of Baltimore has called us, the city of, of uh, New Orleans has called us, and then we respond. And it turns out to be much more, uh, much more efficient. These things are expensive. They're $3 million to open um, 
If you don't have guaranteed memberships, you'll lose another million dollars in the first year, so you'll be in the hole $4 million year one. It takes a long time to dig out. So you've got to have partners like cities, universities, and corporations to step up to make it happen. Uh, but in any, any major city, this thing will, uh, this thing will fly. Uh, it just takes a couple years to get up and running. Like, build that community so it'll be self, uh, self funded. And then we use Dr. Richard Ford as rise to create a class to identify the actual cities themselves and kind of rank order which ones we want to go after. Uh, but generally, we respond to uh, incoming requests. Good question. Great question. And we have a question here. Hi, uh, Chris Martin from Pledger Marketing PR. Uh, this is kind of building on what she just asked about. You said you're in eight cities right now. I was wondering which cities those were and what your plans for expansion, if you could talk about that, are in the immediate future. Sure. So we have three in the Bay Area, San Francisco, Redwood City, and San Jose. Uh, we think we can do another two. On the East Bay, we have five. We'll have five in the Bay Area. Uh, we, we have Phoenix uh, with ASU and Chandler. Um, we have Dearborn with Ford Motor Company. Uh, we have uh, Austin, Texas with uh, Lowe's uh, Home Improvement. And then we have uh, DC and Pittsburgh with DARPA and GE. We've announced St. Louis. Um, that's with Washington University, two other universities, Boeing, Arena, Monsanto. We've announced Los Angeles. That's funded by the developer of the city um, of LA. We've partnered with the largest European retailer. We're opening five locations uh, in four locations in Europe starting with Paris, Elio, Grenoble, Milan, and then one in Brazil and Sao Paulo. Those will all be open by the end of uh, next year. Uh, Abu Dhabi will open by the end of the year. Louisville will be open by the end of the year. A little bit of luck, Tokyo will be open uh, by the end of the year as well. Um, we think every major city uh, will have at least one, if not dozens. So that minimum will get us to three to 500 locations um, uh, globally. We're trying to build essentially as Kinko's for the 21st century. So I think there'll be a thousand or 2,000 of these eventually. There'll be different sizes. Obviously, we won't know the entire uh, market. There'll be a whole bunch of other competitors uh, in the space. But this, we, we democratize access to the tools. You look at uh, artificial intelligence and manufacturing technologies and the desire to use materials that are grown locally, influenced by local designers and so forth. You need, therefore, a local manufacturing hub. So we think this is going to work. Um, all the way down to communities of about 250,000. Currently, we target communities of a million or more. Thank you for asking that question. Great question. I, I, if you don't mind my sharing, so I, I had this unbelievable shake up moment last, last night when I was able to introduce you to Kwanzaa Hall. And, and you can, any of you who are from Atlanta know Kwanzaa. And now that you've met Mark, I mean, the sparks were flying. I mean, literally, the energy that was passing between you was, was incredible. So I'm sure Atlanta is going to have a, a tech shop here soon, too. So yeah, please yeah. One question. More questions for more? Okay, well, we're finishing on time. Great. Thank you so much. This is an incredible inspiration. See you back here at lunchtime. Have a great morning. I look forward to hearing what your day is like um, throughout the day. Don't forget.